Today, guys, we're here with Jamie McAvity. Jamie, thanks for joining us today. How are you yeah. doing? Thanks for having me. Doing great. You were introduced to me as a crypto OG. I think we've become friends since then, but what does it mean to be a crypto OG? Mm, I think, you know, you can date, you can date yourself to the starting date continues to move uh, up as time goes on. Um, I wasn't an OG OG. Like I don't consider myself as much of an OG because when I came in, I looked up to the existing OGs, which, which were the 2010 through 2012 class. I, I got into Bitcoin in 2013, um, ETH at, at the launch, I think in 2015, uh, and, and a few other projects sort of as they started. So I've been an investor in the space for over a decade. I'm now um, the co-founder and CEO of a Bitcoin mining company. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty deep into everything. It's my hobby, profession, passion, uh, one of my main interests. So, uh, yeah, I guess that makes me a bit of an OG th these days. Yeah, we, we were doing the crypt, uh, the typical crypto thing the other night. We, we met up um, at a bar in the evening and just found ourselves in a corner in the back talking crypto and mining technology. Yeah, no, that was a great conversation. I think we were supposed to hang out for an hour and... We both ended up uh, having to leave to, to barely make it to our next meeting two hours in, which is yeah. awesome. I really appreciated your investment philosophy uh, when it comes to non-Bitcoin crypto assets. You know, I, I think that that market is, it can be a little cynical because it does. There are just these crazy illiquid um, assets, tokens. They pump. It's, it's ripe with opportunism, but I, I did appreciate your framework. And I think you're thinking about those markets in the right ways. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I know we um, we talked about mining, and I think that's something that's talked about a lot with with crypto, but not many people really understand or even die deep. You know, they deeply dive into that space. Let's talk a little bit about that. What does it mean to be a Bitcoin miner? And if someone wanted to get started today versus getting started in 2013, what's changed? Oh man, that's there's a lot. I mean, the, the mining industry has effectively developed into an industrial scale industry in uh, in that decade. But I mean, the the right way to think about Bitcoin mining is it's basically like one part technology, one part energy. You might even say two parts energy, one part technology, and. The similarities in energy is that you know, Bitcoin is a commodity. You're competing with other commodity producers to produce that commodity. The winners are those who can produce the commodity very, very efficiently, which in the case of mining Bitcoin means having a very low cost electricity source. And the other important comparison is that Bitcoin mining is very similar to the energy business, the commodity business in that you make an upfront investment, you have, a, you have a very heavy upfront CapEx investment, and then you earn your return denominated to in, in kind as the commodity that you're producing. So you drill, you drill an oil well, you have exposure to the commodity price of oil, you build a Bitcoin mine, you have a bunch of exposure to the commodity price of Bitcoin. And... What's actually funny about the crypto ecosystem is that because of those heavy upfront CapEx requirements, most crypto funds uh, do not invest in mining. It's also a very hard space to win. It's extremely competitive. But most crypto funds, it's the antithesis of what they're looking for in an investment in that it requires a lot of CapEx. So you're not going to make a thousand X on a mining company. You're just not. Um, and if you invest in a private mining company, you're illiquid. And most crypto funds are investing for the prospect of making a very large return in a hundred to a thousand X, maybe a little less. And they are investing in an asset class that has liquidity. And in mining, you know, you are 
not getting either of those things. So it's, it is um, kind of off in its own little category in the crypto ecosystem, this energy business that is, has its own unique characteristics. What struck me during our conversations, you know, I, I really like analogies. Um, we love analogies here at Digital Wealth Insider. We, we love breaking down these complicated concepts into things that people can understand and may be familiar to them. It's, it's almost as if the way you're describing it, it's very similar to if we were going to set up a gold mining operation, except maybe the caveat is everybody's mining on public land. So it's really about how you manage your costs and how you scale your infrastructure and achieve efficiencies there versus going out and find something because these miners are constantly working to solve the same equations, or I should say the same problem set in order to earn the Bitcoin as a reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's a, it's an appropriate comparison. The one thing that makes mining truly unique amongst commodity production is it's actually more of a conversion commodity conversion than commodity production the the basic functionality of a mining computer mining farm is it it runs the computation to attempt to solve a bitcoin mining block and win the block reward it does it all day long 24 as close to 24 7 as possible and because it is performing this intensive computation all day long and these, these mining farms scale to be many, many hundreds of megawatts at their largest, it's extremely sensitive to the cost of electricity. And when you boil it down to its simplest form, it's effectively converting electricity into bitcoins. And so what, what makes that notable and very unique is that you're actually sitting in the intersection of two very volatile commodities, where in our case, we're located in West Texas, which has a notably volatile power grid. Prices for electricity range from negative $30 a megawatt hour to plus $5,000 a megawatt hour. And, and we are harnessing that volatile electricity to produce Bitcoin, which is also an extremely volatile commodity. So the first 10 years of my life, I was a commodity futures trader on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange. And I was trading energy derivatives and sitting in the intersection of those two volatile commodities provides a lot of opportunity for optimization if you are a trader and a, and a risk manager by trade. So it's, uh, it's very similar to traditional commodity production in its upfront capex intensity and its exposure to the underlying commodity price that it produces, but it's also unique in that it's, it's really more of a conversion, whereas gold... Gold mining is not very electrically intensive. Oil production is not very electric or electrically intensive. They're really more land intensive. And you find a good deposit, whether it's an oil well, a gas well, a gold mine, and then you you know it's specific to the geographical characteristics of that actual land. Bitcoin mining, as you mentioned, it can be done anywhere. It's all on public lands. We're hooked into a public power grid. Um, so it's, it's unique and similar uh, at the same time. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, to, to pull on the string, it, it's almost as if it's on public land and everybody already knows where the gold is. So there's <laughs> right. much less of an art of figuring out where that is and then right. buying the land and owning those rights and different things like that. And it's, and it's more of we know where it is. It's accessible to everyone. Now we have to get it in a more efficient way than anyone else. Exactly. Yeah. And so you're like the, the stud or the, the hero of a, um, a gold mining company or a, uh, an oil and gas company would be the geologist, the guy who can read underneath the earth and, and tell what's underneath there and, and how viable the prospect of extracting it is. The, the value, the equivalent of the geologist in a Bitcoin mining company is you know, your, your engineers, your electrical engineers, your mechanical engineers, your software engineers who are trying to, to, as you said, figure out how to perform computation in, a, in as efficient a way as possible. And that means building data centers efficiently, organizing uh, electricity transformation from high voltage to low voltage efficiently, 
um, orchestrating your your mining fleet in terms of the software that's running and optimizing that versus the power cost. And Bitcoin mining is there's not any really other computational industry that's like it because it's the equivalent of running a computer like a Corvette. You know, you're trying to dump as much fuel into the engine to get the highest RPM and highest horsepower uh, uh, possible. Bitcoin mining is it's the equivalent of electricity for that. The more electricity that you can run through your computing fleet, the more Bitcoin that you get out of it. So it becomes a very thermally sensitive operation. You're trying to maximize the longevity of your computing equipment while pushing as much electricity through it as possible. Interesting. And when an investor thinks about, you know, I want to be in crypto, right? And there's all these different ways they can diversify into the space. There's, there's different vehicles. There's do I do it myself? There's Bitcoin mining. How do you think about the value proposition, the attractiveness for investing in a company like yours that does Bitcoin mining versus just buying Bitcoin, for example? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I am I'm the largest investor in uh, in our company, so I'm I, I'm buying I'm buying what I'm selling. And <laughs> um, historically, our company has outperformed the return of Bitcoin by about three X. So. The way we think about it is if we can't beat a Bitcoin return, we really have no reason to exist. Bitcoin is uh, easy to store, it's liquid, it has no counterparty risk, and it's fully transportable. Our equity securities have none of those characteristics. We are illiquid, we, there's counterparty risk to us from the investors, and it's not transportable. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's effectively the exact opposite. Uh, and so we have to beat a Bitcoin return. And an investor should view our company as a um, the means to outperform Bitcoin. Uh, but even even many investors still say, I'd rather just hold Bitcoin. One investor told me Bitcoin is the only asset that I own that has no counterparty risk. And I don't want it. That's the only reason I own it. So I don't want to you know, move away from that. And I didn't have a good answer for him. But he did give us an idea, and that was um, the genesis of one of our uh, kind of flagship financial products. So we are a Bitcoin mining company. We operate Bitcoin mines, but we also have this, uh, this burgeoning financial services business where we offer one core product currently, uh, which is a Bitcoin-denominated bond. Uh, so investors can lend us their Bitcoin. We pay them back a yield in Bitcoin. We pay them back their principal in Bitcoin, and it's a venture debt product, so it has a little bit of warrant coverage in the company. And it's not a taxable event when you lend Bitcoin as long as you're paid back in Bitcoin. So we were able to address that part of the market of, of some investors who didn't want to give up their Bitcoin exposure or sort of uh, attempt to ride with us on our journey to outperform Bitcoin. So this product gave them a little bit of equity exposure, a little bit of yield, and the baseline return of Bitcoin as a commodity. Let's um let's talk counterparty risk real quick, just for the audience. Let's define that. I'd love to hear from you how you define that. And then how do you guys sort of help minimize counterparty risk? Yeah. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, you know, the biggest counterparty risk would be in in within cryptocurrency ecosystem, letting somebody else have the private keys to your assets. Um, especially without doing your homework on the nature of your custodial relationship with them. So um, FTX, for example, the, the cryptocurrency exchange that went bust last October, turns out that uh, you know, the, the nature of the custody arrangement between FTX customers and the exchange was pretty favorable for the exchange. Same thing was true with Celsius, which was a lending platform that went bust around June of 2022. Um, turns out that Celsius was able to gate uh, redemptions for customers who had deposited assets on the fund. And then those customers were below secured creditors in some case. And there was even a minute there where they thought that they were gonna be below the equity holders. So um, counterparty risk, I would say, is effectively when your assets your equity, your debt, or your crypto assets have an exposure to an operational risk or failure of the person 
with whom you've given the assets, you've, you've, with whom you've custody the assets. Um, in our case, you know, we have our, our lenders have counterparty risks to us. We offer them a first lien over the entire all the assets of the corporation in exchange. Um, another kind of type of counterparty risk that exists for us is we have counterparty risk with parties that we engage in power trading with. If we buy a long-term power hedge from a counterparty in the power market, their ability to perform on that hedge is, it depends on what happens with their balance sheet and their business. They also have counterparty risk with us because our ability to buy power is predicated on the viability of our operations. So uh, lots of different types of counterparty risk, but I think the one that we, we talk about the most in crypto is custodial risk when you give your assets to someone else and what the, the legal obligations of them are with regard to controlling and holding your assets. Yeah, there's a, there's a, from my experience with investors and people that are getting into crypto, there's a huge amount of education that's needed in general around these concepts, right? So the idea that if you have your assets on a major exchange, that you may not be able to access those, especially if let's say a government entity comes along and, you know, forces some action that freezes assets. And then, you know, this idea of, and that's really cool that you guys do that. So just for edification of our listeners, it, you know, when a company is facing bankruptcy or some sort of, you know, catastrophic, catastrophic event, debt holders are paid back first, then generally it kind of goes down the waterfall of, you know, there's different classes of debt holders, there's different classes of shareholders of equity. And of course, the devil's always in the paperwork, how that works. But generally, you want to be at the top of the stack, you want to be the first people paid back. And that's the most valuable position, because generally, there's going to be something if not a full redemption available to those people um, in the case of a, of a worst case scenario. Right. Yeah. And so that's, that's what we give to our lenders is uh, the top of the capital stack first lien position on everything. So in the event that our business fails, our lenders will be paid back first before any of the other investors and, and, and our employees get paid back. I'm also uh, one of our largest lenders. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in that, that class of investor. It made it a lot easier to pitch it when I said, you know, I put all my Bitcoin in, so I'm going to be right alongside you. But it's getting people to lend their Bitcoin because it's the one of the only assets that they can custody themselves on a hardware wallet in their safe at home. It's it is tricky. You know, most most Bitcoiners, maybe not most, but many Bitcoiners do not want to take any counterparty risk at all with anybody else uh, in terms of lending them their Bitcoin or even custodying their Bitcoin with them. Yeah, understandable. So you've made your entire career doing contrarian investments. How has that been and how have you dealt with, you know, the volatile swings of the nature of the asset classes that you've been in and also the, the doubters or the haters? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I've been a trader my whole life and the one thing that every successful trader that I've ever met knows is that they're, they're not always going to be good. You know, traders have a tendency to be realistic, maybe a little pessimistic and cynical. And, and that is because a really good trader is probably only right 60% of the time, maybe 70% of the time, 40% of your job is making mistakes. And when you make mistakes, you feel this tremendous pain. Uh, and when, when you do well, it never feels as good as the inverse of the pain that you felt when you were doing poorly. You never hold your winners as long as you hold your losers. Uh, and, and so the first thing you learn is that your human instincts are fighting against you. Your emotional state is fighting against you as you are trading. Uh, a great expression I was told as a, as a young trader was, a trader is really paid for the decisions that he doesn't make. A trader is paid for when he does nothing. And uh, you, ha you have to pick your spots. You have to be very disciplined. So contrarianism, the way that I think about it is 
you're putting yourself on the other side of the market and you're playing for situations when the consensus view on a particular asset or uh, any given trade unwinds rapidly. And when that happens, if you have the other side of that, it makes it so that you don't have to spend that long. You don't have to spend nearly as long fighting your human instincts because the market moves so quickly. So you have all these people rushing out of a single trade. You're on the other side of it. It doesn't necessarily matter that you were right. It more matters that the doorway to get out of the trade is only so small or so large, and you have thousands of people rushing for the doorway. So it ends up basically breaking the door, which would be a, a very high volatility event. Um, and you know, Bitcoin, you could, you could view Bitcoin as the ultimate contrarian bet, or you could even say it's, it's the broader cryptocurrency ecosystem where you have this legacy system where government issued money that doesn't hold its purchasing power very well is what everything in the economy is denominated in. And then you have this cryptographically designed, economically perfect, unbreakable rules system in cryptocurrency. And the, you know, the cryptocurrency ecosystem is worth um, $2 trillion, maybe plus or minus a little bit as of today. Bitcoin just broke 50,000, so yay for us. And the international economy, inclusive of all asset values of every single economy, is worth hundreds and hundreds of trillions of dollars. I think in the U.S. alone, our equity market is worth 60 or 70 trillion and our property market is worth 200 trillion. And that's just one country. So, you know, maybe six or 700 trillion dollars. I don't even know the numbers. You have this small system that's 2 trillion and then you have this other system that's 600 trillion. If you believe that the small system is the future, when everybody rushes from the big system to the small system and the doorway is only large enough to accommodate people, the only way that those two forces can reconcile is a massive expansion in price. And so it's obviously when, when, you know, Bitcoin was in the hundreds of dollars, the asset class was worth a few billion dollars versus a six or $700 trillion asset class. So the, the uh, volatility potential for the contrarian trade was much greater, but I still think there's another 10 X here in the next 10 to 20 years. And then there's another 10 X. It, it, it's going to stop appreciating as exponentially, but, um, there's still plenty of wood to chop here in terms of a, a great trade. Yeah. And you know, you're involved in a lot of different parts of the crypto ecosystem. How do you think of Bitcoin differently from other coins? Um, I think that Bitcoin is the closest thing to a, a, a sure thing in the, in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. It's established. It's got a lot going for it. Now we have an ETF, so it's the only crypto asset that a an institutional investor with a with a brokerage account and a, and a regulated kind of equity investment mandate will be able to purchase. Um, so the way I would describe Bitcoin is it it has a lower return potential than say a very small cap um, up and coming crypto asset. And over the last seven, seven or eight years, if you had picked non-Bitcoin cryptocurrencies very well, you could have made a thousand times your money. You could have made you know, 200 times your money if you were a really, really good asset, a crypto asset investor, and you, you allocated your capital wisely. Whereas with Bitcoin, your return was closer to a 10x. Um, and so with Bitcoin, you have lower volatility, has the lowest volatility of any crypto asset. It's the, the most uh, well-established. It has the highest likelihood, I think, of being what ends up uh, staying the, the dominant store value for the ecosystem. But you can make more money by trading non-Bitcoin crypto assets as long as you trade them well. In that regard, I would say a cautionary tale. I have seen a lot of investors lose everything trading uh, altcoins or shitcoins is what we call them. You know, uh, there's a lot of, of ways to lose it all, whether you could get exploited, you could get hacked. Uh, 
you could get rugged. Rugged is when the guys who are building a particular cryptocurrency pull the rug out from you and take all the funds or just disappear. Uh, and I would definitely recommend to 99% of people to allocate funds to, to a good manager and uh, to not trade themselves. If you are going to attempt to trade yourselves, be prepared to commit 12, 12 to 15 hours a day and to spend the first six months reading and studying and asking questions and learning industry best practices because in that first six to 12 month period, a typical journey of, of a large percentage of cryptocurrency investors is they buy some Bitcoin or some ETH that, you know, they make a small bet on Coinbase and, and they buy some Bitcoin or ETH. Then they make a, a nice return. You know, they may say they make a five X on it. They believe that they're smart and they got the game figured out. So then they start trading more obscure cryptocurrencies <laughs> and they get wrecked and lose all their money. And then they come back and they decide that they're a Bitcoin only person and that they, you know, the rest of the crypto ecosystem is scams. Um, only a small percentage of crypto traders make it through that that initial journey because there's just a lot of ways to get completely wrecked and um, you know and there's definitely an element of luck in surviving those events. Yeah, I mean you're also on the cutting edge of technology, right? So you know DeFi and you know staking and liquidity pools; these are fairly new things and. You know, nobody knows what the next new thing is going to be, but certainly it's going it's going to happen soon. And so, you know, it's not even I agree with you totally, by the way, with the time commitment. And I've seen that journey myself through other people and, you know, obviously had to go through it myself. And, you know, there's learning lessons along the way. Education always costs money. These these will cost you um, as well. And then the, the caveat is it's not like, you know, learning the bond markets or the stock market where generally once you have a fundamental understanding, they aren't changing intrinsically very often, right? If ever, but you know, crypto, there's always some new primitive or some new addition to the ecosystem, you know, like it was staking, then it was DeFi. Now we have restaking and, and, you know, these things are experiments, right? And there's some companies that are executing them better than others. And so you're just constantly drinking from a fire hose. For me, that's really fun. But for your average person that's thinking they want to do this like they do stocks, which is I want to spend a couple hours on a Sunday, you know, kind of looking over my portfolio and deciding what to do next. I just don't think it cuts it. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And you could definitely make the case that it's worth it because of the, the numbers that we discussed uh, earlier. You know, you're talking about competing for multi hundred trillion dollar asset class values here. And for some of these up and coming crypto assets, you're paying valuations in the tens or hundreds of millions. And so it, it justifies these, these, these really kind of low probability wagers because the, the prospect of one of them hitting and becoming successful is a thousand X. So you could, be wrong on 500 things and still make double your money. Uh, and, and so it's, it's worth learning. It takes a lot to learn. The best way to learn is to use every new thing that comes out. The trouble with doing that is that if you use every new thing that comes out, you, you're probably going to lose a lot of money in the process. And so it, you know, it is really, uh, you just got to try and survive and keep learning and, and know what to look out for if you're going to be successful in this industry over the long run. Yeah. You know, this is, this is why I think the industry is so similar to venture capital, even in the liquid stage, just with the liquid component is because it's very similar to very similar to venture investing. And then there's angel investing and most hardened, you know, we had like David Cohen on, who's one of the most prolific angel investors out there. And he's invested in, you know, hundreds of companies and many of those have returned zero. And the idea of, you know, you're going to take a small amount of capital with a limited amount of time and enter an asset class and then suddenly, you know, just 
by default or by chance or probability have some big wins. It doesn't usually play out that way. I also think crypto is kind of unique in the sense of the contrast between doing it well and doing it poorly is essentially mathematically infinite in the sense of, like you said, like you can even be in the best coins, but you could custody of them poorly. You could right. click a malicious link and get scammed. There's just so much risk right out there and not knowing the risk, right? So having an unknown of the unknowns, right? So on an unknown, like risks versus known unknowns, um, it's just so risky. And you really don't have that in the traditional finance world, right? Like if I invest in 50 startups, I, for, for the most part, I understand I own stock in these startups, the stock is essentially safe. And if the company's successful, I'm going to be successful. But, you know, you can invest in a very, in a project that will end up being very successful, like Ethereum, you could have been invested in Ethereum at a dollar or $10. You could have lost it along the way due to user error. You could have lost it along the way due to um, a scammer or, or some custodial issues. There's just yep. lots of ways that you can get in trouble, even making the right underlying picks. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, think about just even in the last... 10 years, you had the Mt. Gox hack, where many of the early Bitcoiners who bought Bitcoin lost, lost their assets in the hack, and they still haven't been made whole to this day. It was almost 10 years ago. I think it might have been 10 years ago. Bitfinex was hacked. And in that hack, they dollarized the losses. So they basically liquidated you from crypto um, to USD. So you lost your exposure there. Uh, FTX, same thing. They they dollarized the claims at when Bitcoin's price was about seventeen thousand. So it's there's a lot of ways to to get taken out, and I think the the best practices are self custody your assets where you can. If you're going to be invent, investing in early stage crypto protocols, part of what you're doing there is dividing your attention and and learning lessons by being invested you have to be ready to press your winners cuz you're you're you know you put a small investment into something that's just getting going and you see something that looks exciting and has traction or you have a really positive relationship building with a team and you believe in their ability to execute that's you're really buying one foot in the door and the knowledge that's there's a huge asymmetry to what you know versus what the market knows because you're paying attention, because you invested early. And so you should be pressing your winners. If you're not going to do that and you're just going to spray around and pray, um, then you, you, know, you might be better served just buying some Bitcoin or ETH or Solana or whatever and uh, having a small diversified bet on the space and hoping that you've picked, you know, the, the major incumbents become the inevitable winners of this, this asset class. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the layer cake of how deep crypto gets and upside potentials, it's, it's almost infinite. Like you, you almost have to really enjoy that in an asset class in order to appreciate it and survive in it. Like it, it, it like right. it's almost like there's something wrong with us, right? <laughs> for like, sure. Yeah. Or yeah, th that's why calls for adoption, I think are like, like surprise that adoption hasn't really hockey sticked yet. It's like, guys, you know, we just had the, the second largest exchange in the ecosystem collapse. And the first largest one is being invested, but invaded by the Department of Justice and paid a multi-billion dollar fine. And there were God knows how many exploits and hacks. Like we're very early. This is for people who are on the extreme end of the risk spectrum. Those are going to be, be the people who make 10 to 100 times their money or maybe more. And of those people there will be 90% of people who do not participate in that because they get their collateral damage along the way. And sure. as it moves further along and gets safer and we reach the, the part where the technology adoption curve starts to accelerate upwards, you won't be able to get that much of, of a, an exponential return anymore. But as it is now, the, the volatility and the chaos, it's, it's part of the opportunity. It's a reason why the opportunity exists. Yeah, for sure. I mean, volatility is almost always looked at as, as a negative word. 
but it, but it's not in the sense of if something can go down 30% a day, it can go up 30% a day. And that's just yeah. the nature of volatility. I, I have a similar euphemism that I say, I said, something can only be volatile if it has gone up. There's nothing that's worth zero that can be volatile in order to have downside volatility. It has to have gone up some amount. So, you know, volatility is good. I love that. If someone wanted to get involved in mining today, is it something you recommend or something ah. that's too hard now? We went through a lot of hardship as a company in our first couple of years and it was pretty brutal and we were lucky to make it out. We, talk, we, talk to me about that. Well, counterparty risk. We, we go back to that. The golden rule of mining, I would say, is you have to control your real estate. You have to control your real estate. You have to control your electricity contracts. And, and if you don't do that, you're taking a counterparty risk with somebody else. So one of our first mining locations was a piece of property that was owned by somebody else. They were the name on the electricity bill. And they were running what was effectively a fraud where they would take money in for um, hosting services from other miners. They would charge a small markup on the electricity and they would, in exchange, provide data center hosting for Bitcoin mining computers. They just weren't paying the electricity bill on the other end. So they were making 100% gross margin on all of their revenue. Um, and what should have been a, you know, a 25% gross margin, they were just making 100%. And they were effectively gambling that the electricity wasn't going to get shut off by the utility. Um, and we did due diligence on them. We protected ourselves. We had some, some recourse to them, but we didn't control the land. We didn't control the electricity. And it's kind of like not your keys, not your coins, not your land. You know, you can't control what's happening on the property. And so once we realized that they were effectively running what was a fraud. We attempted to remedy our situation through the courts and we notified the courts. We notified the other customers who were in this data center that there were a number of liens that had been filed against the property. Their electricity accounts were passed due by millions of dollars with um, the, the grid and the, the utility providers. And we went to the courts and we said, Hey, this is an outrage. You know, we, got to do something. And we got sucked into a, an 18 month court process. And so because we didn't have enough startup capital to buy the land, to buy the transmission infrastructure and get all that set up correctly, we opened ourselves up to counterparty risk with another party. Um, if you want to eliminate that counterparty risk, you're looking at a, a seven figure investment up front just to get the infrastructure component correct out of the gate, you know, and it's probably more like a low eight figure investment to be perfectly honest. So the barriers to entry are very, very high. Um, and it's extremely hard to get started. The way that I would approach it, if I were a young person who wanted to get into it is I would, you have to take counterparty risk because otherwise it's just impossible to get started, but do your due diligence on your counterparty. Don't just go buy a bunch of miners and then rush to get them plugged in somewhere. Start with your infrastructure. Find a power plant that has a bunch of stranded power. Go to uh, the Texas Panhandle or you know, the, the border, the Oklahoma border there on the other side of the Panhandle. And that area of the country has the most stranded renewable wind power and negative electricity pricing of, of anywhere in North America. So there you have a counterparty who has a problem of having a surplus of electricity and you have a business that could potentially consume that electricity. Find the guy who runs the power plant, sleep outside of his office for a week and you beg him to give you a chance uh, uh, or go raise $10 million if you, if you can find it. Uh, that, that would be the two ways to get started. Or, or invest in a well-run mining company. Yeah, or buy some stock in Corman, uh, and uh, yeah, just let somebody else do it. Like, uh, yeah. like your fund, you know, it's it's really hard. It's really hard. There's a lot of ways to get sliced up. Paying an expert to do it is not a bad option. 
Yeah, I mean, look, like my philosophy has always been, I think this is the philosophy of some of the most successful and wealthiest families in the world is, you know, look, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to be an effort to be an expert at anything. So you've got to choose one or two things. And once you become an expert in anything, you realize the advantage that the experts have because of that work they put in. So right. pick one or two things you want to focus on and then go find somebody that is strictly focused on that um, and, and utilize whatever vehicle necessary to, to kind of coattail on their success. I, I could not agree more. One of my favorite expressions uh, from my, my startup journey uh, was that startups do not die from murder. Startups die from suicide. And the most common cause of suicide is distraction. Spreading yourself too thin, being obsessed with your competitors, not choosing a single thing to focus on and do it really well, those are the causes of suicide. And as a startup, your advantage is that you don't have a board of directors breathing down your neck you really have nothing to lose, so you can take a bunch of risk and try a bunch of stuff. And once you've tried a bunch of stuff and you figure out one thing that works, you need to focus on exactly that and become try to become the best at doing that. And it's just so easy to get lost on that journey, to get obsessed with your competitors, to get distracted or try and do too many things at once. Um, and I mean, it's not surprising that the richest families in the world focus on on that as as one of the core virtues of their investing philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. I love that analogy, the, the suicide analogy. I think that really resonates when I reflect back on my time, you know, as a classic VC, it, it's so true. And, you know, in the crypto space, we went through this, this phase where people over raised without having to kind of go through the pain points of figuring out their mm -hmm. focus. And that always comes back to bite companies, even if they have $100 million in the bank, which seems so counterintuitive, you would think the startup with $100 million in the bank is the least risky bet out there. But if they haven't figured out product market fit, and if they're not focused, you can burn through that pretty quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, the finding product market fit is it, it crypto is so funny like this, how if you have a really good idea, and you're good at fundraising, because your investors are going to get liquidity so early they don't really i mean th there is a a lack of emphasis on execution and and too much emphasis on liquidity um and uh it's almost a feature and and not a bug of traditional private company venture capital is that there is no liquidity you know the employees aren't looking at their they're token vesting and, and uh, thinking I'm a millionaire and I'm good, you know, I can go get liquid right now on this decentralized exchange. The stock is illiquid. The distractions of the market price are, are largely removed. And in crypto, that whole model is flipped on its head. Um, you know, it's, it's a gift and a curse because that's what makes it so attractive is that it gets so liquid so much earlier. But also the number of big raises that end up being zeros is way bigger in crypto than any other industry, I think. Yeah, look, when you when you burn the boats, you better make sure the island's in good shape. But when you don't burn the boats, you could just leave. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, well said. Yeah. Well, listen, I know we got limited time, but it's always a pleasure, man. Um, love to have you on soon again. You've got a wealth of knowledge about the space, and I think your approach is uh, is really smart, really tactical and strategic. So thanks for your time today. Likewise, Mike, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure getting to know you uh, recently. And uh, yeah, looking forward to staying in touch. Good luck out there. Stay safe. All right. Talk soon.